I want to introduce uh, John McGar. He is president and co-founder of Fresh Squeezed Ideas. Uh, it's an award-winning foresight strategy and innovation consultancy attracting clients from all over the world. Uh, it's one of the few firms that transcended being just a research company and has emerged as one of the few method agnostic firms focused on helping clients make great business decisions that create economic value. He's got 20 years of marketing, management, and consulting experience. He's an outspoken advocate for the role of cultural tensions as the subconscious driver of winning brand strategies and innovation. Uh, take it away. Thank you. I need a place to stick my uh, laptop. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Is this on? Is it working? Excellent. Let's uh, get this going. Um, Jeff, you think you had a tough, I actually am before lunch, right? So I appreciate everyone uh, hanging in there with me. Um, I think Jeff basically just validated everything I'm going to talk to you about. Um, and a lot of it is wildly inconvenient. Some of it will um, test the thickness of our skin collectively a little bit. And um, if I piss anybody off, I really apologize. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to be provocative for a reason, OK? Um, it's fun. So there is a dominant narrative in healthcare, and that is that science has the power to transform, right? And of course, in medical science, it definitely has transformed our lives and, and our longevity. It's eradicated diseases. You know, polio is essentially gone from North America, you know, um, all, all kinds of mumps, measles, all that stuff <laughs> is gone. Uh, the ability to deal with heart attacks and, and high blood pressure and uh, high cholesterol, it's truly amazing what, what has been brought to our lives by medical technology and medical science. What I find interesting is, though, the counter narrative, and this is not unique to healthcare, it exists in the financial industry, it exists in, uh, in the consumer goods sector. There is this consumer counter narrative. This is a, a New York Times bestselling author, uh, Robert Whitaker, has a, written a book about, he's taking the example of, uh, of, of psychiatry. And of course, psychiatry, you know, back in the day, and Prozac is the one that really uh, transformed things, psychiatry was very inconvenient in that it did not adhere to the medical model or, or the, the hard science model that was used in, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, antibiotics, as an example. No hard measures, no necessarily tangible outcomes that you can measure, right? Um, and it really would be great if we had objective metrics. And so pharma created objective metrics for psychiatry. And at the end of the day, what I find fascinating when we speak to doctors, you know, despite many, many years now of having lots of amazing drugs for psychiatry, is that they never cease to be amazed at the power of placebo. It's really amazing. And the actual drugs provide, really, if you look at it, a little extra. But placebo is amazing, right? So I, I know that's wildly inconvenient, of course, right, for, for us in our industry. But the metrics certainly did improve business for, for pharma. The trouble is that the, the counter narrative actually resonates in our culture, right? Now, uh, yeah, this is where I'm testing the thickness of our skin here a little bit. I don't adhere to the point of view. I'm just you know, parroting what I see uh, in the media. The important part about this is if it's resonating with people, it's resonating also with doctors, because doctors hear this from their patients. They hear the skepticism. They hear the fear. And for them, for doctors, it affects them too. So is it possible that maybe doctors are a bit more hesitant to prescribe you know, a drug for obesity or for depression? You know, that can certainly impact your business. And, and then you have some interesting artifacts where even doctors, this is a couple years old now, but even doctors are saying, OK, w wait a minute. You know, new guidelines. And of course, GPs love to hate guidelines, but there's these new guidelines. And we're supposed to be advancing therapy. But really, this looks like a way to get 70% of all Americans on statins. You know, well, well, you know, that means a whole lot of side effects, a whole lot of problems. You know, in whose interest is that really? I'm not here to pass judgment. I just find the artifact is very interesting. And it validates that, that there's a counter narrative, OK? So how does the pharma industry or, or any healthcare uh, marketing agency respond, right? 
what I find pharma does more often than not is pull out more science. If I have to prove the narrative, I better bring more science. Right? It, it's the reps who are trained in the science, the science, it's the answers in the science. Right? Well, here's a quote from a doctor when more science was brought, trying to be more persuasive with the science. Wait, 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 you're trying to confuse me. Don't, don't just dress up the same science. The idea that science is being used as a weapon from this doctor's point of view, right? And it starts to raise the question, you know, is more science really the answer, right? Now, I'm using metaphor here, right, for, for you imagery people, right, <laughs> to be a little provocative. But here's the question, what if the emphasis on science is actually unintentionally reinforcing that counter narrative, right? What if it denies pharma companies the opportunity to, to have their own positive narrative get through? Because there's not a pharma marketer that wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to go manipulate people today, right? Everyone is actually trying to do the right thing, trying to do good. Sometimes we get in the way. So my point is we can transform the marketing mission and we say this across all of our clients, but pharma as well, it applies. Pharma marketing can be a force for good. A force for good in the lives of the shareholder, certainly, because that's important. The marketer themselves, so they can look at, the mirror, look at themselves in the mirror in the morning and feel good about the work they do. In the eyes of the doctor, so that what they do has more meaning in the eyes of the patient, so they have, enjoy a better life. So how do you be a force for good? Well, number one is to let go of the crutch of science, okay? Maybe we don't need more science all the time. Sci well, I shouldn't say, it's not that we don't need more. It's just that science are table stakes. Science are absolutely table stakes. Docs don't have a problem understanding science. Like sometimes we forget that even GPs were the smartest kids in school, right? <laughs> They're all really smart. So no matter what kind of clinical trial clients conceive of, they get it. Like, it's not hard for them to understand. So browbeating them with more and more data doesn't really change much for them. It's to think a little more broadly. You know, what's creating the disease? Right? Like, what, what is actually creating the cancers that we're dealing with, or the hypertension, or the type 2 diabetes? You know, could pharma actually champion some social change where you're looking at, you know, how do we alter prevalence and progression of these diseases, okay? That's adding value. Think of cancer, you know, what a loaded topic. You know, one of the challenges of cancer is, you know, it's, it's a shame that low cost but low outcome drugs are available, but the high outcome, high cost, drugs are only available to a very few people that can afford it. You know, imagine being the doctor that has to be in that situation and making that kind of call on behalf of their patient. It's terrible. I wouldn't want to do that, right? Type 2 diabetes. You know, there's a number of reasons why diabetes is frustrating. It, it, it's very much like we could make a different decision than eat what we eat or not exercise the way we don't exercise. There's our decisions being made. There's a whole pile of reasons why that's happening that have nothing to do with the drugs. Pharma could tackle that. It would take a couple generations, so it's not like it's, you're going to lose any scripts by doing it, right? Because it's not easy. But you gain a lot of friends by doing it. Speaking of diabetes, are we really committed to diabetes in in Asians or African Americans because we keep making the same generic medications for the same generic audiences. It's amazing to me that the healthcare in, or the, the hair care industry has figured out that different types of people have different types of hair. Why can't we do it in pharma? Right? What doctors want to know is that you're actually on their side, right? Rather than only on the shareholder's side. Okay? I mean, we know the shareholders need to be made happy, and they should. There's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with making loads of money. But doctors are dealing with eroding status, right? Everybody's a doctor now because they can get onto WebMD before I even go to the doctor, and I can tell the doctor what I want, right? That's a little problem. That's problematic for doctors, right? 
They don't get the respect. They don't have the same agency that they, that they used to because of the you know, changing regulations. After the blockbuster era, of course, pharma was regulated to not be able to do anything. So doctors are kind of left, hey, uh, I'm the only one left standing here managing chronic disease. Where'd you guys go? Right? It's very troubling for them. And they see you're still making gobs of money um, you know, when they're the ones that are really under some pressure. So they don't necessarily feel like pharma is on their side. Okay? Being on their side is understanding deeply what it's like to actually stand in front of a patient and tell them, this is the cancer drug that you can afford to have, even though this other one would do a great job. So here's a quote from a doctor. This is actually a specialist, not a GP, but prove to me that you're on, this, on my side by going to the core of the issue. You know, he, this guy's calling right out for, I actually need help in this other area, which is social change. So how do you write a new narrative for good? This is what we do as an organization. Okay? You need a little foresight. You need to have a perspective on, on the world and how doctors' needs are changing, how patients' needs are changing. We come to this from cultural anthropology. We have a, a portal uh, that you can visit called the culturalforceslab.com. Uh, that is how we monitor what's going on in culture, because that actually drives our values, which is actually what ends up driving our behavior and why I like my doctor or don't like my daughter, doctor, or why I, or my daughter, for that matter, uh, or. Uh, <laughs> Or, uh, or how I feel about what the farm industry is doing or stocks or you know, the world. You need to have some respect and be ha you know, have the courage to get some intimacy with both the doctor and the patient. We do that through social science-based you know, explorations of what their lives are, what their experiences are, their goals. And then you need some frameworks that are just very pragmatic about, okay, now that we know all that, you know, rather than just be delighted that we're smarter than we were before, how do we actually make some marketing decisions with that? We have a, a brand model, you know, everyone's got a model, but ours takes all of these other pieces and actually integrates them to be able to build a brand strategy that may include driving social change as part of the strategy, as an example. Ultimately, the consulting part of it is, let us help you align your values with the target, whether it be the doctors or patients or ideally both. How does that affect your positioning? How does that affect your brand experience that you want to create? How does that uh, affect your business model even? And how do you innovate around that? I mean, one of the things that a lot of pharma companies forget is that the sales reps are actually an actor as part of the brand experience. I don't know why all sales reps aren't wearing uniforms. Instead, they're all wearing suits. Great suits, look nice, very professional, that's great, but it's not necessarily a branded experience with a particular idea. Normally when I say that, if the reps are in the audience, they shoot me when I get outside, so I apologize to anybody if I'm advocating McDonald's hats. Right now. But here's an example of some work that we did following this model for a client. So for those who have uh, any knowledge of people with severe allergies, you know, near fatal, or fatal allergies, um, there's a real problem in that people that have these kinds of allergies are really scared, like they are paralyzed with fear. And so there are some people who are very vigilant and they do the right thing, but a lot of people, it's kind of like the wart, right? That, yeah, I know, my, I, have a, I have a neighbor down the street, he, he's my same age, he's had this kind of allergy for years, doesn't carry any kind of device at all. He's a ticking time bomb as far as I'm concerned. If you try to scare these people straight, they they will deny, avoid. There is no rational reason why they will not protect themselves. So rather than try to educate them, right, which is what pharma does, right? Science is power and knowledge is great, right? So let's educate them. They, can, they deny it, they escape every time where it doesn't apply to them. So we said to the client, look, you cannot educate these people into doing what you think they should. So let's try the opposite of that. Let's try humor. So they have this crazy ad that I've never seen an ad like this in pharma before, the woman in a bucket of water but to plug in the hair dryer. Right? You wouldn't do this in real life. That is just enough to get someone to lower their guard a little bit to go, hey, what? And then they can deliver in the education messaging. Right? Question is, well, what does that do for their business? How about that? After 20 years in business, 
brand doubled in size. Right? That's what we like to do. So the message is, think about how can you be a force for good. And if you catch me outside, I'll give you the reading list for anyone that's interested. But I'd love to take a couple of questions if there are any. Right before lunch. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> we have time for questions, but thank you. Thank you. Nine, eight, seven, <laughs> six. It's ticking down five. at the back. There's like a timer back there. I'm just happy I made it on time. If, if there's no questions, we exactly ended on time, which is, I think, an achievement in itself. Um, so I would encourage you also to, to track down John and, and talk over lunch. Thank you all very much. And I think thank we're you. to proceed down to, to general session again. So thanks. Thanks, buddy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well.